I was broke. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I what attracted me to the program was uh, or to the to the movie was I had heard from my agent for about two years that Darren Aronofsky was interested in working with me, which and I said, "Who's Darren Aronofsky?" And because he's pretty much sort of like this cult kind of independent, really arty farty kind of guy that, uh, and I met, I mean that complimentary that, you know, Hollywood has sort of been trying wooing for years to come out and make big, you know, commercial kind of movies. And uh, the more I saw a couple of his movies, I saw Pie and I saw Requiem and I was very impressed with the integrity and the intention that he had with his sort of filmmaking and uh, all the information that I was, that I, when I asked people whose opinions I respect that I got back, it was the same kind of vibe or information that let's say you'd hear about Francis Coppola you know, young Francis Coppola, who I worked with years ago at Rumblefish, and uh, and then I met Darren. My first meeting with Darren was quite interesting because I'd heard so much about him, and it was, uh, uh, I was very curious because the information I, I got on him was so impressive. Uh, he, I heard how smart, that how, my my shrink even told me he goes oh Darren Aronofsky he's he's, he's very smart. Uh, I also heard things about him that made me very eager to meet him. I heard he he was his own man. He he does not compromise. He's smarter than the rest of us. And the information I got was 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 really interesting. And so when I met him, um, he came walking across the street, and I, I I actually was sitting in a restaurant in the village, and I didn't know what he looked like, and I was like looking across the street and. Because like one thing I don't do is I don't meet people in offices. So I said you got to meet on neutral grounds. So I picked the restaurant, and I don't even meet people on neutral ground. I meet them in my territory. <laughs> so uh, especially guys like him, I didn't want to meet him in his office or his production company. And so he agreed to meet me, and I see this guy pull up on a bicycle with a crash helmet, and I go, oh, "That's got to be him if he's wearing a crash helmet." And he he sort of like walked across the street like his balls were too big for his pants, and he had this kind of air of on his face, this kind of like, he knows something that you don't know, you know, and he came over, he introduced himself, he right away started saying, well, you've ruined your career for the last 15 years, you've self-destructed, he goes, and I'm trying to do a movie with you, and I, I can't raise a dime on your name, and if I do do this movie with you, you're going to listen to everything I tell you, you're going to do everything I say, and you can never disrespect me in front of the crew, and I can't pay you, and I thought, well, he's, he, He's smart and he's got a lot of balls. Uh, this is the kind of guy I want to work with. And then I, he gave me the script. When I saw the script, I was a little disappointed because, you know, coming from a sports background, I, you know, I didn't want to do, you know, I thought, oh, a wrestling movie. You know, I'd like, I'd, I thought maybe I'd do, you know, some kind of dramatic movie with him or a love story or, a, I don't know, a science fiction movie or something. But, you know, the wrestling story was very, me coming from a professional boxing background, I had looked down on that sport because it's it's pre-orchestrated, you know, it's pre-determined the outcome, and it's like wrestlers. I thought, you know, oh no, they're like. And then I read it, and I went, well, I thought, well, I've spent a lot of time in gyms and much many more years than he has pumping iron in, in and in gyms, and I didn't buy a lot of the dialogue. So I said to him, I said, look, you know. I, I want to make this, I want to, you want me to do all those things you've asked me to do. I said, you, you have to trust me. To, to, I want to make this personal. And I want to, so I said to him, I, you know, how I would say, I said, the, 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 the scenes with uh, the young daughter, I said, this is what I would say. Um, these are things in my life that I have said. You know, sometimes when there's somebody that you love a lot, and who's getting ready to leave you? You know, you only have like a few minutes to get your point across, and it's a, there's an air of desperation. There's you you know that if you you can't you can't if you can't move this 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 thing, you're going to lose or something does something that you love. So, I, I made it personal, and I recalled moments that I had with uh, my wife when she was taken off, and I used it because I don't have a daughter, so I you know I just made a different change there, and uh, Darren went with the flow with me on that, and uh, so he let me rewrite all those scenes, and he let me write the speech at the end where I said, well, I never thought I'd be in here again, and I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, 
I don't walk as good as I used to. I don't talk as good as I used to. I don't have as many teeth in my mouth, and I'm not as pretty as I was anymore. And and I was mainly, and then I have to go on about you know, uh, you know, they told me I was washed up. They told me I was finished, and you know, about I was really making it personal, talking about uh, not being able to work in the acting business for 14 years. So he rolled with that, and then also the the taboo subject. Um, of steroids, you know. I said, "Listen, I've been in the gyms. I've heard everybody talk." I, I said, "We have to incorporate this in because it's all about uh, bodybuilding, steroids, how you look, take suntan and peroxide bottles." I think with Randy, the character in the movie, you're finding uh, you're finding a man who he he he's ten years past his prime. He has. At one time in the 80s, he was a big star. He was in Madison Square Garden wrestling in front of, you know, thousands of people. You know, he had a wife at one time and a daughter. And and the, the and when you're on the circuit like this, like with any sports, you know, you travel a lot and they drive a lot. They, you know, they, they team up together and they share gas money and they go to different venues. And along the way, you lose contact with the ones you love. You lose contact with... Um, the ones you're supposed to be responsible for, and, and your loved ones, your your wife, your daughter, and along this journey, he 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 self-destructed, and he got older, and time's gone by, and I think it transcends just the wrestling sport. You could you could make a case for a footballer, you know, who's who's moving on an age, or and then they sell them to a you know a a, a, a team that's not too good, or a, a different league, or a boxer that just says, I know, I just need one more fight, but. You know, he's already, my old boxing trainer said to me one time when I was very young, I was asking him about a question, and he said, you know, Mickey, every night, every fighter in one night gets old. And for these men who, who are sportsmen, it's, they, they've, they, they, they have a regimen, and this, this is the main thing. They have a regimen, they get up, they do their run, they, they go to the gym, they, they have their fight coming up, they train. When they don't have that in their life anymore, whether it be wrestling, football, or whatever, uh, a lot of them become lost souls, and it's a painful existence, where, which which relates to Randy because uh, you you're living in what I have been told, in what I've gone through. You're living in a, a state of hopelessness, and you're in a you're living uh, almost in shame. You know, I remember uh, times. Uh, over a 10-year period, I'd go into a 7-Eleven to buy a pack of cigarettes or something. There'd be several people in the store, and some idiot in the middle of the night would go, Hey, didn't you used to be? Aren't you? Who? You're... And it's like they say it real loud. It's like, Jesus Christ, let me get out of here, you know? And sort of that's like how Randy, like, there's a scene in the supermarket where it's sort of like that. The physical thing was very difficult, uh, especially this was a movie that was a five million dollar movie. There wasn't a lot of money in it, um, and so Darren made a very interesting choice. He chose to shoot it in a very objective, documentary style way, handheld camera, so we could move we could move quickly because of the budget. I mean, a lot of the wrestling matches were were uh, that we did were all done during live shows, and we would run in handheld. There'd be a, a, a match on, and then we'd run in, and Darren would announce to the audience, "We're doing this. This is my name's Darren Aronofsky, Mickey Rama, and we do it, and we do the matches right in front of a live, crazy, you know, like wrestling audience." And it would be—it was a lot of pressure because you know, I—I I had these guys are really big dudes, you know. I had to like put on 28 pounds, but I had to put on 28 pounds of muscle, not fat, and I had close to seven and a half months to do that, and then four months to crash course to learn how to wrestle. It really did because, you know, I walk around at, you know, 193 pounds and I got up to 228 pounds and, you know, I started to move differently. I was eating several meals a day. I was lifting very heavy weights. I had hired this Israeli commando, uh, this trainer who was brutal with me. It was like, you know, three hours, split routine, three hours of, of working out, six, seven meals. He would, every day, he would cue me on what I was eating. And maybe some nights, because I went back home to Miami to train, I'd be out in the clubs, you know, at night, you know, running around. And I'd walk into the gym, and he'd go, he'd look at me, and he'd go, fuck you. 
And I said, what? He goes, you were out last night drinking. I go, what? Yeah. I said, do I have to do cardio today? And he goes, go. You know, and it was like, fuck, man. He, but I hired somebody who was strict with me. And because he was a military guy, especially because he was an ex-Israeli soldier, he, was, he wouldn't have me, you know, he wouldn't have it. When I used to box, I used to come out to Sweet Child of Mine. And I remember we were doing a scene, you know, in front of the live show, and I was behind the, the curtains there, and, and I, it kind of reminded me of when I was during my fighting days. And I, I said to him right away, could you put Sweet Child, of, Sweet Child of Mine on? And they found it, and they blared through the thing, and it felt, I felt like the old days. And so that all worked. So I called Axel up, and, I, you know, I explained the situation with the budget, and he gave us Sweet Child of Mine. After about six days, I really felt that we were, that I, I went. This movie's going to be special. This feels like the best mo the best work I've ever done, and this feels like one of the best directors I've ever worked with. After six days, and um, when the movie was over, I was so proud of it, and I hit certain emotional moments. Uh, I, when I met Darren, uh, I knew that he wanted he why he wanted me. I knew he wanted me to also open up and revisit some very dark, personal, painful places, you know, in my life, and as well as the physicality. And um, actually, when I got replaced on the movie early on, uh, because they couldn't raise the money on me, I, I was relieved that I got replaced. I was the only one who was happy about it, because I thought, man, this is a lot of work. There's going to be a lot of hard work for no money. And I was broke at the time. And uh, I remember doing the emotional scenes, and, uh, and they all, you know, he challenged me. He kept pushing my buttons. My uh, dog had got a stroke a few days earlier, and I didn't know if she was going to make it or not. And just before I had to do the scene with the daughter, he came over to me, and he said to me, he goes, Loki died. And I just fucking broke down, and it was, boom, let's shoot. You know, and it was like, I was a wreck because I didn't know if he was kidding me or not, you know. My dog, you know, she's been with me 18 and a half years, and it was like, you know, uh, it was just, it was crazy. And, it, and then the night was going on, and I did the, I nailed it on the first take and the second take, and then he said to me, I want you to really bring it. And I, I'm going, did Loki die? And he goes, I said, and then he goes, I want you to bring it, make it, give it to me, do it for, do it for Loki, you know? And it was like, fuck. So it was, you know, he knew how to push my buttons and challenge me, and, or if I was not using, there were certain substitutions that I was using, whether it be my late brother or, or my ex-wife, and so everything became very personal. You know, I've been out of the loop for about 14 years, so it was, you know, they kept, you know, in the last several years since I started to get back into it, you know, they'd give me a day here, two weeks there. I mean, my reputation was terrible and I behaved terribly, and. I'm the one that was the cause of it all, and uh, so, you know, Robert Rodriguez would give me a job here for a few days, or Tony Scott would give me a job, or Stallone would give me a job, Sean Penn put me in the pledge in a really good role for one, one day, and, you know, and then gradually, because it was about account, being accountable. And, you know, most of my career I wasn't accountable, and I didn't care about rules or repercussions, and I paid the price for it. It feels a little surreal, because when you're, you're when you've, I, you know, when you like, I had a career for a little while, and then it was gone. And when you're like, a, kind of like a somebody, you know, and then you're a nobody for 14 years, and you're in a, you, you're living, as my shrink would tell me, in a hopeless situation because it's out of your hands. Because it was never about my acting, it was about my behavior. So he said, but, so living in a hopeless situation, Losing my, 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 my career, my wife, my house, my money, my brother. Um, um, it, it was living in a hopeless situation with only hope. And you can go a long way on hope, even when you're like in the desert or in the dark and there's no daylight. So with all this happening now, I mean, after all these years, it's, I'm very thankful, I'm grateful. You know, somebody said to me the other day, oh, now you can really stick at the Hollywood and tell them, you know, I don't fuck off and I don't, I don't, that's not the way I feel because I'm the one that burnt all the bridges for, I had pieces inside of me that were, um, 
broken and I didn't have the under, I didn't have the knowledge or the information to fix them until I went and got help. Well, I think a lot of my issues when I, you know, self-destructed had to do with, I, you know, I became very hard and um, I came from a very violent background and I, I handled things out of respect and pride and honor, sort of old school kind of mentality. And I think that really covered up issues I had of abandonment and shame because it's more easy to walk around hard than it is feeling like worthless. And um, I think there's a big part of me that's always going to feel that way. And so I don't really like watching myself.